we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to get it right. Thank you for another a chance to study your word. God, open the eyes of our understanding, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts and minds to receive your word. God, we thank you for those that are here, those that are on their way. May you be glorified in all that we do and say today as we continue to study your word, to show ourselves approved. Our workmen need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. We thank you, Holy Spirit, guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Uh, again, again, welcome to our evening Kingdom Life Bible study. Um, Tonight, we are continuing in our series on different. And so tonight, what we're going to do, um, before we jump into the video, I'm going to do a quick recap from last week. Since we started a new series last week, I'm going to recap that real quick. Then we're going to jump into the lesson uh, dealing with different identity tonight. And then um, from there, we'll jump into a discussion about the, the video. So I was going to start with the video, but I know it's going to be some good discussion. And if we start with that, then we won't get to the lesson portion. So I'm going to get the lesson portion out, and then we'll, we'll go ahead into discussing the video itself. Um, so as usual, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. We'll go through some slides, and then I'll stop the presentation uh, when it's time for some discussion. So let's see. Let me know if you are seeing my screen. Good to go. All right. Again, so this is week two of our four week series um, discussing a topic called different. And again, we're using this video um, from Right Now Media. Hopefully, everybody's been able to access the video and watch them um, so we can continue you know, to, to study that accordingly. Uh, This week's lesson is on a different identity, focusing on Luke chapter 7, verses 6, 36 through 50. Uh, quick recap from, from last week. We talked about different foundations, right? Making sure that our life is built on the right foundation, making sure it's built on the, the solid rock. And so some of the points we talked about last week, you know, this world has many ideas about success and, and how to end up being successful, but God has a different idea about how our lives should be lived. And so if we want to experience the fullness and the abundance of life that God gives us, we have to learn how not only to, to read scripture, but to act on what it says. To not just be hearers of the word, but doers of what the word says. Because his word is what changes our lives, right? And so we got to make sure that we're getting the foundation of the word of God into our lives. And so as followers of Christ, we got to live our lives on the foundation of God and his word. Not on the passing things of this world, right? Because the, the world stuff is temporary. And if you build your life on that, when it's changing, your, your life crumbles. And so we got to make sure that we're building our lives on a firm foundation because the wise man and the foolish man can both build, but only the one who's built on a solid foundation will be able to withstand the, the storms of life. And so we got to make a, a constant effort to, to read and pray and not only just do that, but to act on what the word says, you know, so we can be sure that when the storms of life come, because they will, when they come, you'll be able to stand on them and stand on the word with confidence because you're rooted and grounded and planted on the word of God. And so this week, we're going to be talking about a different identity. And right, so this is lesson two. And if we're going to live a different lifestyle, we have 
to learn how to make decisions based on our relationship with God rather than on what everyone around us is doing, right? Sometimes we got a tendency to follow along uh, the ways of this world, hoping to kind of blend in and be accepted because that's the norm and that's what's happening. And, you know, so we, we don't want to be a, a square, you know, so we, we want to fit in, but our identity in Christ should dictate our decisions, not our social media status, not our standing in society, not how everybody else perceives us and, and not, you know, somebody, you know, Facebook famous and Instagram famous and we, we want to get as many likes as them. We want to get as many shares as them and, and all of that. But that shouldn't be where our decision making comes. Our identity in Christ is what should dictate our decisions. And so what is identity? Right, our identity can really be kind of complex. It's kind of, you know, it's a lot of factors that go into it. So it can be complex to understand because it's shaped by so many factors, right? Genetics plays a part. You know, your, your, our DNA, our, our makeup is a combination, you know, of our parents and, and grandparents to, to an extent, right? And so we don't realize sometimes the impact of our genetic makeup. You know, genes don't just determine how you look. A lot of times it, 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 it impacts your behaviors, your mannerisms. And, and so you can grow up, you know, apart from your, your parents, right? You could have been adopted. You know, your parents just could have been separated and you just not, may not have grown up with one parent or the other. Yet when you get around them, you act the same. You, you got the same mannerisms. You got the same stuff. Why? Because it's in your DNA. It's, it's part of your identity. It's part of your makeup. And so not only does genetics play a part, but your culture, right? We, we have certain cultural things that are unique to the U.S. When you go somewhere else, there are different cultural practices that help to shape people's identity, right? Your exposure. I always say you, you can't rise above your level of exposure, right? So what we've been exposed to opens our eyes to different things. You know, your experiences, both personal and in society, all of these things kind of help to shape our idea and concept of self and our, our concept of our identity. And so we often base our identity around what we do, right? So I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a teacher, I'm a preacher, I'm a musician. And so when you ask a person who they are, they often respond by what they do. Well, who are you? Well, I'm a doctor. Oh, that's your profession, but who are you, right? And so some, a lot of times we, we can't separate them. I'm, I'm an athlete, you know, I, I'm an NFL player, I'm an NBA player, I'm a hockey player, I'm, a, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. So we identify with what we do. And, and that may not necessarily be who you are. And so a lot of times if we get so caught up in our profession, you know, when we, you know, we get into a situation, we, we try to pull out, well, why are you talking? I'm a doctor, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm, you know, and, or I'm a preacher, so I, I expect this, or I'm a musician, so I expect that, or whatever the case may be, we, we kind of base in um, our identity around what we do. And so life is an interesting thing, but it's really um, a journey. Oh, I got somebody that's trying to get in here. Life is a journey of, of discovery of who you really are, right? God created us on purpose and for a purpose, right? And so your true identity really cannot be found apart from the one that created you in the first place, right? One of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails, Nothing wrong with planning. You should plan, but you got to make sure that your plans align with his purpose. Because if you make plans that don't align with his purpose, life becomes frustrating because you're planning and trying to go one way, but God has purposed you to go another way. So you're wondering why it's not working because he's saying, I, I'm not, that's not what I have for you, right? So, you know, nothing wrong with planning, but you got to make sure your planning aligns with what God has called you to do so that your, your plans are in alignment with your assignment. God has plans for you to give you an expected end, to bring you to a certain place. 
And so it's important that we make plans that align with that. So re regardless of all these different factors, right, your identity comes from within you. When it, when it all boils down, your identity comes from within. Right, there's a saying, as within, so without, right? So your external reality is a reflection of your internal self. When we look at people and they're going through what we consider to be changes on the outside, right? They change their hairstyle, they change their dress, they change, you know, how they're acting, they change, you know, doing all of these things on the outside, we'd be like, oh man, they're going through something, you know, they, they, they change and they just that and the other, but what we see outwardly is a reflection of what's going on inwardly. And so a lot of times when you, when you go into other people's space, like you go into someone's you know, office or you go into someone's house and it's real neat and orderly and everything is in a certain spot and that's a reflection of them, right? They are neat and orderly. And so it, re, it, re, it, it reflects in their environment. On the flip side, you go into somebody else's environment and it's chaos and confusion and stuff everywhere. And you know why? Because they got a lot of chaos and confusion inside. And so it just manifests outside. So as within, so without. And so our God-given identity should give us the grounding that we need to thrive in our uniqueness as children of God. Sometimes we, we try to blend in, but God made you who you are. There's only one of you. Like you only, only, you're the only one with your thumbprint. You're the only one with your exact genetic makeup, right? God made us to be originals, but most people, they die a, a copy of somebody else, right? There's nothing wrong with following other people's examples, but be the best that you can be, right? Learn from them and incorporate that, but don't try to copy them because now you're trying to do something that you may not be purposed to do. And so we got to recognize our God-given identity and, and stand on that because that's what gives us our uniqueness. There's only one of you. Be the best you. Right? So your identity in Christ. Right? In, in the video, uh, one of the things Jonathan has stated is that when you understand your identity in Christ, no matter what you do, you can truly be who you are because that's never going to change, right? Even when the circumstances in life change, when you understand your identity in Christ, I, it, it don't matter what's happening around me because I'm rooted and grounded in him. In him I live, in him I move, in him I have my being. And so our identity should be tied to, to our relationship with Christ. And so when, when we're secure in the identity that Christ gave us, we're able to operate out of the love and the grace of Christ. This means being able to forgive ourselves as well as forgive others. But, you know, we can only thrive in our God-given identity when we stop trying to be like everybody else. Why? Because we have to be different. God called us to be different, to lift up a standard of righteousness, to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. You can't be a light if you want to blend in with the darkness, right? You, you can't be the salt if you want to be bland and blend in, right? You got to stand out, you know? And, and so be, because you called us to be different, how are those who are in darkness going to come to the marvelous light if we who are in the light don't share that light with them? If we don't let our light shine before others, that they may see our good works, but glorify him. So we have to be different. And so now I want to jump in, into um, the scripture lesson. And when we finish this, we'll talk about the, the scripture a little bit, and then we'll go into the video. So in, in Luke chapter 7, um, beginning at, at verse 36, it says, and when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner uh, with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and re reclined at the table. And the woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. 
So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them from her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Notice the, the tone, notice how he being a little judgmental, but also notice he said this within himself. He didn't even say it out loud to Jesus. But Jesus answered him, said, Simon, I have something to tell you. But look at his response. Tell me, teacher. Oh, now I want to know. Now I want to I hear from you. He says, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One of them, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them loved him more? And when you look at it, like a denarii represents like a day's worth of wages. So this is one person owed 500 days worth of wages. So that's like over a year, he ain't paid enough, right? And the other one owed 50. And so they couldn't pay it back, but he forgave them of their, both of them, their debts. He says, now, which one of them will love him more? And so Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And Jesus responds, you have judged correctly. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I, I love how Jesus is so direct sometimes. He, he, he's, he's making this comparison. He says, he turns to the woman and said, you see this woman? He said, I came to your house, Simon. You invited me. I came to your house. You didn't give me any water to wash my feet but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time that I entered had not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't pour oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. But the other guests, they began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so when we look at this story, we got these two debtors. And it's an interesting comparison. Because here you have Jesus being invited to, to Simon's house. Now, Simon was a Pharisee. Simon was a religious person, right? So he knew the religious things to do. He wanted to be in the presence of Jesus. So come on, Jesus, come to my house. And, and so Jesus comes, but he, he had no real perception of who Jesus was. Because when he arrived, he just let him come on in. He didn't. He didn't, it was customary when someone came to your house that you wash their feet or provided, you know, something to, to wash their feet because, you know, it was desert environment. You walking around in sandals and, and whatnot, you get there, your feet is dusty, right? So it's customary when you go into a house to wash your feet so you don't drag all that dust and dirt inside. And so he said, you didn't even do that but this woman has washed my feet. You didn't give me any oil. You didn't anoint my head. And so he's making this comparison between the two of them. And so some lessons from, from the parable, right? In the parable, Jesus pointed out that it is the one who has the bigger debt who will most likely be more thankful. As believers, as Christians, as, as citizens of the kingdom, we, we should remember that we always need Jesus. Right, you should never get to the point where you think you got it all together that you don't need the Lord no more. That you you can do it all by yourself. But we gotta recognize that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, if it hadn't been for the grace of God, if it had not been for the covering of God, if it had not been for God's grace and mercy, where would we be right now? 
I know I wouldn't be here teaching y'all no Bible study if it wasn't for the Lord. But but in this video, Jonathan says that that Simon had a comparison problem. And this is a lot of times what we do, compare ourselves with other people. But Simon found himself calling the woman a sinner, while Jesus made the point that they were both sinners in need of forgiveness, right? And so in, in order for him to say she's a sinner, it's like he's exempting himself from sin. Oh, who is, she's a sinner. If Jesus knew who she was, that, that she was a sinner, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be entertaining her, right? And so we got to realize that none of us is perfect. We all sin, right? All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? And so have you ever had that, that mindset where, you know, a lot of times we put degrees on sin. Like this sin is a great sin. This is a little sin. And, you know, this is just a little white lie. And that's a great big unforgivable lie. And, you know, we, it, it's okay that, you know, you, you lie and cheat and steal, but it's not okay that you, 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 you know, homosexual, you, you, you know, you're gay. You're, you're, you're right. So we put all of these degrees on stuff. This one is forgivable, but this is not, right? But sin is sin. And, you know, it, it's, we all got our issues. We all got something that, that, you know, someone could say something about us. So we can't hold ourselves too high and mighty thinking that we got it all together because we all are work in progress, myself included. And so we're all, we all need forgiveness. Sometimes we get caught up in the thinking that we're better than others and then we forget that we, we're in desperate need of God as well. Right. Comparing our sins, you know, to our family, you know, we, we might not be struggling in this area. So we look at other people that are struggling and they're like, oh, they they doing this and they doing that. And I don't want to be bothered with them. But, you know, that could have been you. Right. You got an issue, too. And so we got to realize that when we compare ourselves to other, it gives us kind of the wrong perspe perspective, you know, of our own issues. It makes us focus on other people rather than looking at ourselves. You know, it's like you 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 can't see you you focusing on on the little speck in in somebody else's life and not paying attention to the big old beam in your life, right? There's something in front of you. There's something in your own life that you may need to deal with. But we try to look past our stuff and look at other people. So another thing, Jonathan mentioned that Simon identified as a Pharisee instead of identifying as someone wrapped in the truth of God's word, right? So Simon, he sat back and relaxed, you know, not realizing that he should have been acting like the woman with the alabaster box. He should have been reverencing Jesus. He should have been anointing him. He should have been recognizing who was in his midst rather than just, you know, living high and mighty, ha <laughs> Jesus at my house, he's not at yours, right? He, he, he was so caught up in the fact that Jesus would, would come to his house that he didn't even perceive who he was and treat him according. But the lady with the alabaster box shows us the meaning of our identity in Christ, right? Her actions in the parable serve as our example, right? She was a sinner, right? But knowing the debt that she owed, knowing that the love of God would cover her sins. She came to Jesus. She trusted him. She, she worshiped him. She accepted her forgiveness from him in order to go back and live a life that's full of testimony. And so you and I should, should do the same and recognize that we need Christ in our lives and that our identity should be tied to our relationship with him. Not in being religious and knowing about him, but having a personal relationship with him. Not just knowing what the word says, but applying what the word says to our actual life. Not just, you know, thinking about it and reading the word, but actually doing what the word says. Right? So the, the Pharisee knew all about worship. He knew all about reverence and honor. He had head knowledge, but no heart practice. And so sometimes we can get so full of knowledge and information, 
that we don't apply any of it. Meanwhile, this woman recognized who she was in the midst of, and she identified with that, came to him with her need, and anointed him in the process. Now, now Luke, this, this story is actually in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but Luke takes a, a different uh, approach. When you look at the other two, um, Simon, one, he was a leper, you know, two, uh, he was a Pharisee, and, and they, the other disciples got mad because she had poured out this, this oil on Jesus, and they were like, this could have been used to feed, to, to, to sell and, and feed the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you're going to have always, but not me. But what she has done will be a memorial. And that for years to come, people were going to remember what she did because not only was she anointing him, but she was anointing him in preparation for his burial. Because right after this is when Judas betrayed him, which led him to the cross. And, and so this was a... a a pivotal point in the fulfillment of Jesus's mission. So God has called us to be a full service toward others, forgiving toward others, and humble in the process. And so um, discussion question for, from the two debtors. Looking at this story, in the video, John says that Simon had a comparison problem, right? He found himself calling the woman a sinner while uh, Jesus pointed out they were both in, in need of forgiveness. And so how does Simon, the Pharisee, the religious person, how does he treat this quote-unquote uninvited guest compared to the way Jesus does? Right, so I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. I just want to, you know, get some, some comments from, from this story. And how did Simon, right, the, the religious one, the one that go to church every every Sunday, the one that that watch you know services online and, and and sing you know worship songs. How did that religious person treat the quote unquote uninvited guests compared to the way Jesus did? We'll talk about that for a few minutes. Then we're going to jump back in and we're going to talk about the the stories in the video. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. All right, feel free to um, raise your hand or unmute yourself. With Can I unmute my page? This is Sharita. Okay, go ahead, Sharita. Hi. Well, I can say Simon, did like a lot of people do, look on the outside. Mm -hmm. He looked on the outside. He saw the outside of what she was doing outside and where Jesus looks at our hearts and what our hearts, you know, so I can say. Simon was looking, looking with the physical, <laughs> physical eye. Exactly. Oh, yeah. He was looking with mm -hmm. the physical, looking at the outward appearance, looking mm -hmm. at, you know, what her quote unquote reputation, you know, but Jesus, he looks at our heart, right? God, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at our heart. Good, good. Hamid. Yeah. Uh, how you doing today? Um, good, sir. That's good to hear. Uh, did Simon know who he was dealing with? I don't think he knew. If he actually knew who he was, then he actually wouldn't have did what he did. Because, like you said, it's proper custom for them to offer somebody water after they're coming in from the sandbox. So, wipe your feet off. So, I don't think he knew who he was dealing with to, to begin with. And I just think that he was a typical Pharisee, I mean, personally. I think he just was a person that just saw a man that was doing miracles, and okay, that's all he was. He just, uh, like, he, he wasn't the son of God. He, he wasn't who he said he was. He was just another guy that I'm inviting to my house that everybody uh, uh, is bound to, but he's coming into my house. But as you see, she knew who he was, and that's what kind of struck me is that like, how did Simon not know and she knew? Hmm. And, and another thing that I, I find crazy, this is going, I'm going off on a tangent, but was she just crying or was she crying to wipe his feet? I, I didn't kind of get that, but like, that was kind of weird to me. Like, was she just crying and got on his feet or was she crying to wipe his feet? But that's all. Okay, so um, good, good, good observation. And, he was your typical Pharisee, right? You, you know 
about Jesus. But that's the thing. It's the difference between knowing about him and knowing him for yourself, right? It's the difference between knowing that, you know, he's a quote unquote man of God and knowing he's the son of God. Right. So I, I want Jesus to come to my house because I, I want everybody to know that he came to my house. But I don't really have a perception of who he is. I, I want to be I want people to know he came to my house. But if you don't perceive him, who who he, he really is, you won't receive from him. And so even in that when 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 she came, his response, even though he didn't say it out loud, he said, well, if he was really a prophet, he would know who he's dealing with. He, he would really, so he, he wanted to be in the presence of Jesus, but not really know who he was because he wouldn't even have thought that way, right? And so, you know, that, that's one thing. And as far as the, her being, you know, tears, tears of joy, tears of reverence, you know, you, 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 you recognize that you are in need. You find the one that can meet your need. That's, that's overwhelming. And, and, and the fact that, you know, she came, she didn't come empty handed. She brought the box with her. She came with her offering. She came with her, you know, her, 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 me, her offering. I, I'm coming to, to worship and I ain't, I ain't going empty handed. I'm coming, I'm bringing not just a little, I'm bringing a whole jar full of expensive, you know, perfume so that I can anoint him, so that I can, you know, lay it down at his feet and, and act of, of worship and whatnot. And so, it's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing him for yourself, right? Knowing, going, going to church and having a relationship with Christ is two different things. So good. Any, any other comments? Go ahead, Dior. I see you. Um, listening to you all is um, amazing. And it, when um, the other gentleman was just talking right before you and then listening to you, it makes me realize that sometimes we um, take for granted because, you know, because we're saved or because we're Christians and we know God, we take for granted the access that we have to him. Mm. And Simon had literally Jesus is in your house. And you had a nerve to say something about somebody that heard he was here, right. found out where he was, got there, and then literally gave all that she had to him. But you're with him. You know what I'm saying? You're like you, you, you commune with him or you have, let me say it this way, you have the opportunity to, to commune with him, but you don't. And mm. I think sometimes we get so, we get lazy, we get comfortable, even with church. You know what I mean? Because we can go there and we get the praise team and we get the word and everything we need is there. But when we got to put that work in outside of church, you know, just like now with COVID being here and us not being able to be in the physical church, even though we are the church, um is making us figure out do we like you said do we really know do we know God or do we mm. have we just heard of him you know so I think that it was it kind of you know got my got my senses going like you know am I really taking advantage of the fact that I have access to him yeah that's good you know uh, familiarity breeds contempt sometimes we get so comfortable and familiar with things that mm -hmm. you know we don't honor and reverence God the way that we should because, you know, oh, like you said, everything is provided in the service. You know, if I don't feel like singing, the praise team can do it, right? If, if I don't feel like right. somebody else can do it, right? And so, but when, that, again, that, that's why we got to have a personal relationship with him. That's right. And, and so that, out of that relationship, you know, it, it causes us to not even worry about what other people are doing because it's about my relationship with him. And so if nobody else is going to praise him, I'm going to pray. If nobody else is going to give, I'm going to give. If nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. Why? Because it's not about them. It's about me being in fellowship with him. That's good. Um, I think even when we have the chance to commune with him, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, when we have a chance to commune with him, sometimes we don't because we take that chance for granted and if something comes up, we don't always put God first in our lives. We put that other event first. And even communing with him may not always take the sign of physical communion. It may take the sign of fellowshipping, praising God, or just going to church. And sometimes that's not first in our plans. And now that we don't have it, we realize the impact of not having it. And I really have to think that the church is more than a building. We are that church, and when 
especially Sunday when the under 65 Independence Day comes back, how many people are going to realize what they didn't have for three months and how many people are going to come back and be excited to be back and actually be excited, not just going through the motions of that excitement. Right. That's good. Yeah. I mean, it's going, it's going, this has been an interesting time of not being able to go in, into, you know, the church building. Right. And like I said, it, it kind of forced us to reevaluate our concept of church and realize mm -hmm. the church is not the building. We are the church. And so right. what are we doing when we can't go in the building? Right. right. And so for too long, church has become something that we do. Like I go to church. So when I go to church, I do church stuff. But when I'm not in church, I do regular stuff. Right. And so it, there's this separation. But now that you can't go into the building, now what, what happens? Do, do you not do church stuff no more? Do you not pray anymore? Do you not read the word anymore? Do you not study? Do you not, you know, are you still doing those things and still developing your relationship even though you can't go in the building? So that's good. All right. Good, good, good. So I do want to jump back in, jump back to the presentation, uh, give a quick recap of the video, then we'll come back and, and we'll discuss them. All right. Let's see. All right. Thumbs up if you can see my screen. All right. So that was our discussion. But so the first story, um, Branson. So I hope you had a chance to watch the video. Very interesting stories. But Branson, um, Branson started out watching pornography, right? At, at a young age, right? Any addiction is a stronghold, right? A lot of times we, we don't like to acknowledge or call it an addiction, because just like Branson, we think we can stop at any time. Whether your addiction is cigarettes or alcohol or sex or pornography or whatever, whatever your addiction may be, you know, people are like, oh, I ain't addicted or I don't have a problem. I can stop whenever I want to. But the reality is when that thing sets up a stronghold, it's difficult to just stop. And, and, and so, you know, it becomes a, a struggle. And so Branson, he grew up in the church. Right, even had a dad in his life that was a pastor, but he was still engaged with pornography. Right, we tend to think that or forget that anyone can struggle with sin, no matter the environment. Right, you know, sometimes people think just because you are a preacher or a pastor that we don't have issues, that we don't struggle with stuff. Right, we, we, we have our issues too, just like you. Everybody has some kind of issue, and so you know, have you? ever you know done that like looked at a person whether it was in ministry or whether in your family or you know what have you and expected certain people to be you know sin free and, and not struggle with a specific thing sometimes we think you know that's just for for non-believers but sometimes believers struggle with issues as well and so when we look at his story it's a very interesting story because his father had confessed to him that he, he struggled with pornography and then his mother came to him and his grandfather was convicted and, and sentenced to life in prison for, for the same issues. Now, so you, you can imagine the conversations that was going on within him about who he was. Like here he is, he's, you know, a, a PK, a preacher kid, right? And, you know, my dad's a pastor and now I'm struggling with this pornography thing. Now I find out my dad had the same issue, which, you know, his parents got a divorce and he didn't specifically say that, but I'm sure this was a factor in that. And then now his grandfather. So now he's like, wait a minute, is this, is this part of me? Is this who I am? Right. He even went on to say, does that mean I can't get married because I can't control this urge or what have you? And so, you know, when we talk about genetics, a lot of things that we get passed down to us, we don't realize, I mean, it's such thing as generational blessings, but it also generational curses that, that get passed down. And so sometimes we come into certain situations that we, through no fault of our own, it's, it's in you, right? Just like the nature of sin is in us. Why? Because you look back, you go all the way back to the beginning when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when, when, when sin entered the world, that was before they had children. That happened in Genesis chapter three. In Genesis chapter four, they had Cain and Abel. So 
now every successive generation is born into that sin, right? That's why you don't have to teach a child to lie, right? When they, they little and they did something wrong and they know they did something wrong. Did you eat the cookie? No, but they got cookie crumbs all, all on their mouth. Who taught them that? That, that nature is in us. It's, it's in us. And so we, we can't control it in, in some degree. But Jonathan talked about how Branson's testimony was an example of how we can forget that we're all in the same need of God's grace, that we're all in debt. He started off judging the, the, the men in his life for their mistakes until he realized that his sin was similar. Like, I'm dealing with the same issue. Sometimes we want to judge other people for what they're going through, not realizing that you got your own struggles, you got your own issues. And so uh, Romans 23, for all have sinned, all, what's left out of all, nothing and nobody, right? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't care if you a preacher, deacon, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, you know, mother of the church president, CEO, vice president, doctor, all of us, from the pulpit to the door, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory. All of us need God's grace and mercy to, to make it through. And so you can't put yourself above nobody else because we all got issues that we're dealing with. And so what was the, the turning point, right? They're, they're saying we are what we repeatedly do, right? You, you keep doing something over and over, it becomes who you are. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But the good thing is that we can change what we do, right? Jim Rohn says, when you change, everything will change for you. Sometimes we're trying to change any and every situation. But when you change, the situation will change. And so Branson realized he needed to change in order to keep from ending up like his father and grandfather, right? Even if there's a generational curse, somebody has to stand up, someone who's been born again, someone who knows the word of God, someone to say, you know what, this stops now. I decree and declare that this will not proceed to the next generation. Somebody has to break that cycle. And, and that starts with the choice to, to live right, to live different, to be different, to, to lift up a standard of righteousness. And so whatever your DNA may have been, when you get born again, what? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But now you got to learn how to walk in that newness of life by renewing your mind with the word of God to realize I don't have to be that way. That God has renewed me, that God has forgiven me, that God has the power to break every chain in my life, every addiction, every stronghold can be broken, that I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. But you got to have a relationship with him to realize that. And so he realized um, that God doesn't, you know, instantly changes, right? He gives us an opportunity to make a change. God gives us an opportunity to make a change. You may have seen this this movie um it's a little clip but I, I i like this as an illustration uh let me unplug this so you can hear oh excuse me can i get a refill please coming right up excuse me are you all right yeah no it's a long story but I like stories. I'm considered a bit of a storyteller myself. My husband? Have you heard of New York's Noah? <laughs> the guy who's building the ark. That's him. I love that story. Noah and the ark. You know, a lot of people miss the point of that story. They think it's about God's wrath and anger. They love it when God gets angry. What is the story about then, the ark? Well, I think it's a love story about believing in each other. You know, the animals showed up in pairs. They stood by each other, side by side, just like Noah and his family. Everybody entered the ark side by side. But my husband says God told him to do it. What do you do with that? Sounds like an opportunity. Let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, you think God gives them patience? Or does it give them the opportunity to be patient? If they prayed for courage, does God give them courage? Or does it give them opportunities to be courageous? If someone prayed for the family to be closer, 
Do you think God saps them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? I got a lot, a lot of people to serve. Enjoy. So that's a clip from the movie uh, Heaven Almighty. But it, it's, it's a good illustration that, you know, sometimes we pray for stuff and we think God is just going to drop it, right? You pray for patience. He's not just going to, oh, instantly give you patience. He's going to give you an opportunity. He's going to send some, some wild, rambunctious kids your way to teach you how to be patient, right? You know, you, you want more money. God is not going to drop money out the sky. He's going to give you an opportunity to be good steward with the money you have. And when he see you faithful with the money you have, he'll give you some more because he knows that I can trust you with a little. You, you'll do right with a little. You'll do right with the lot, a lot. And so God gives us opportunities. Um, and so in, in the story, Branson started volunteering at this ministry. He began to, to feel less ashamed and more loved by God because at the ministry that he was volunteering at, it was working with women that, you know, were abused, women who had been sex trafficked, women who were forced into prostitution, people who were in, you know, situations around the whole sex industry. But while he was in this ministry helping them, his guilt and shame for his issue was melting away because now he wasn't focused on him, but he was helping others. And when we take our issues aside and begin to pour into other people it's amazing how god gives us opportunities to deal with our own issues by helping somebody else when you take the focus off of you and you put it on helping others god has a way of taking care of your issues right when you help somebody else god in turn helps you why because that's a seed right you reap what you sow and so when you help somebody else it sets you up to be helped and so he mentioned that you know he knows now that he doesn't have to be part of the problem, but he can be a part of the solution. He can be a light in the darkness instead of being part of that darkness. And that's the same thing in us. We can be a light in the midst of darkness rather than continuing in that darkness. Um, let me see. Ah, so, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run through the rest of this, and I'm going to run through her story, and then we're just going to talk about it all. Because I, I want I want to get to it both, but think about that. I'm I'm, I'm gonna copy this. Uh, uh, how does this make you feel, knowing that God's forgiveness allows us to be a part of other people's solutions? Think about that. Think about that as a discussion. We're, we're gonna come back to it. How did his efforts at the ministry change his perspective about life and purpose? Uh, the second story was about Anaya, right? Anaya was was known uh, by her strength and her overall ability to play basketball. This strength and the talent allowed her to put all her confidence in her talent and reputation. She was known as the tall girl who, who could ball. Uh, when Anaya went home with a concussion, right, she's in the game, she's turned one way, turned back around a girl, busted in the head with like an elbow, knocked her out of the game. She had a concussion, she couldn't come back. And so her life changed because of this. And so she began to feel resentment toward the girl who hurt her because her whole life was affected by this accident, right? You know, she identified as a ball player. Now, because of the concussion and the headaches and all that, she couldn't play ball anymore. And so now her identity as a ball player is challenged. So what do you do when what you identify with is taken away? Um, once Anaya realized she couldn't play basketball, she had the free time on her hands. She had to come to grips with her faith and how she never really had to put it into practice. Right now, she, she's angry, she's resentful towards the other person. Now, now she's faced with an opportunity to forgive. Now she's placed with an opportunity to seek God concerning her life and her situation. And so uh, in the video, Jonathan mentioned that he could empathize with her because he, you know, previously put his identity and his talent when he played football, you know, he made it to the NFL. But just like Anaya, they both found themselves living without the sport that they love, right? So now if my identity is in playing basketball or in football and I can't play that anymore, who am I? And so when, when 
when we place our identity in things um, that we do rather than then letting our actions reflect who we really are in Christ, we remain in this cycle of heartbreak because the roles have changed, right? If you identify as a ball player and you can't play ball anymore, who am I now, right? And it happens with a lot of people. They, they make it to their dream was to make it to the league. And so they made it to the league. They didn't have no dream after that. And so now that that's over, they can't play anymore. They don't, they don't know what to do with themselves. Right, because that was their dream. They don't have an identity apart from what they did. And so um, she had to deal with anger, resentment, forgiveness, rediscovering her identity after the accident. How would you have dealt with the situation if it was you? Right, you, you, you a ball player. You got an opportunity to go to the NBA, the WNBA, and then somebody elbow you in your head, give you a concussion, now you can't go to the league. How would that make you feel? Um, once she realized she couldn't play basketball, she had free time on her hands, she had to come with grips um, that she never put her faith to practice. In what way did Anaya put her faith to practice to develop a deeper relationship with God? So I'm going to stop sharing and give me your thoughts about these two stories and what, what we can learn from, from this. I want everybody to jump at once. Thelma, want to say something? Okay, Ms. Hi, Thelma. everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what I liked about uh, this is how this young man, uh, he was thinking that because his grandfather and his father was so bad, that that was the way he had to go. Mm. But then he found... Christ came back into his life and his whole attitude started to change. And I liked how he was sitting at a brook or something and he had a book in his hand and it was all quietness and peace around him. So he didn't have anything to stop him from thinking or, or losing his place. He had, the he had the time to take in and feel all that that was around him, which was quietness and peace and nobody running after him saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, so, you know, I just found it real restful for myself even today because I, I, I looked at it twice and I okay. thought, yes, that's right. You do have to go into your own little personal closet or whatever and just sit back and take in all that God is giving you. Absolutely. We got to take that, that time to, to decompress and, and just mm -hmm. spend quiet time with God and, and shut the world off because you got all kinds of stuff coming at you from the world. But when you take that time to spend with God and let him minister to you, let him speak to you and let that be the, the source of your identity and your decision making. Sometimes we got to quiet our mind and, and shut it off and spend time so that we can get God's thoughts and God's ways and, and allow that to be our guide. Good. Hamid, I see your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, there was um, just thinking about uh, the guy, Branson. Uh, I didn't look at the video, the uh, me, uh, to be fair, okay. yeah, I didn't look at the video, but from what you, from what I read is, it takes time to break any cycle. No matter what it is, it takes time to break a cycle. Like everybody walk is different in Christ. It takes time to break a cycle. So it's gonna take time for him to break that pornographic cycle. Just like it took time for his dad to break that cycle. And look, his dad became right. a pastor. So it, it takes time to break a cycle. So it's not gonna happen right. in a day. Right. No, right. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is that uh, 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 when you when you hear uh, that um, Branson took the time to want to change, that's it, it, it. Like you gotta have that mindset. You gotta have that certain mindset to want to change. And he had that mindset to want to change. And that's the godliness in him that he wanted to change. And he said he was a PK, so he knew what he, what he was doing was wrong. And I like the fact that his dad came through 
and, and said that, listen, I was going through the same thing. So I, right. I, I got to commend you for that. Okay, good. Go ahead, Deacon Powell. I see you. Yeah, hand. first thing, okay, as a blind person, well, Lisa and I both, we, uh, we have to uh, prove to people that we can do stuff because a lot of times people, because we're, you know, have a visual problem, think that you can't do it, you know, and you put, and you put your faith in practice by showing them that you can. And you can do it. Amazing how we can do it. Yeah. And all, we're always trying to do it just keep living like everybody else would live, live life to the fullest and give God the glory he deserves and just, you know, be grateful for what we do have. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good, good. Um, I mean, we all have our challenges. We that That's part of life, but. Um, and Anaya had hers when she uh, had that concussion, but she had to believe she was going to come back from it. And all the time, we had to believe that every time life throws us a punch in the face, we're going to figure out a way to get around it. It's an old saying that what it, if life gives you lemon, make lemonade. Yes. Absolutely. And I mm -hmm. think that that's. Um, Sometimes, you know, life throws us a curveball. You know, what we were planning one way didn't work out. And then, you know, what do you do that? that I think that, that goes back to uh, last week, you know, being built on a different foundation. Like if you have the, the word of God as your foundation and you identify with Christ, you know that, okay, if this door shut, if God can shut that door, he can open another. Well, you know, if if God closed this opportunity, that means he's got something else for me, right? But if, you, if you're not rooted in that, you could, you know, lose your mind. Oh, my God, it's, and I can't play ball anymore. What am I going to do with myself? I, you know, I'm not worthy, and I can't do anything. That's all I was good at. And, and, and realize that when, when, when God is your source, when your, your foundation, when your life is built on, on the word, when you have a relationship with Christ, he said, I will, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so even though we go through tough times, he's there. And when we can learn to, to lean on him and, and, and trust him, even in the midst of that, realizing that he's going to see me through this thing. And so um, just to go back to, to what Hamid said, it is a process. And, and if I'm not mistaken, in the video, he said he struggled with it for about 10 years, right? So it, it was a long struggle. But like you say, he, had, he was of the mindset that I got to change. I don't want to continue down this path. You know, and, and that's the thing. God is not going to overrule your, your will. It's a choice, right? He, he, he stands at the door of your heart knocking, but you got to open the door. You, you got to be willing to open yourself and say, Lord, I'm available. And, and when you do that, he can change it. He can, he can help you through that situation, but you got to be willing to want to change. You got to be willing to want to do. He that hungers and thirsts for righteousness, what, shall be filled. But if you ain't hungry and you ain't thirsty, he ain't giving you nothing, right? But if you want to, to, you want more, you want to change, you want to get out of your situation, he's there to help you. But some people, they don't want to get out. They, they, they comfortable in their misery, right? And, and, and they want to bring you into their misery because they don't want to change, right? But when you want to change and when you want to do right, God can, can do it. You just got to be willing to do it. Anybody else comments about Branson's story or or Anaya's? Go ahead, Diora, and then uh, Gladys after her. I just think um, after listening to, I could not catch his name again. He talked right before you again. Um, I mean, the yes, um, when he, you know, just basically with Branson's story, how and I wasn't able to watch it either, but I'm even more excited to watch it now. Um, how his dad shared with him his experience and if you take it like outside of family you know because that was obviously generational but just when you are willing to share your testimony mm -hmm. because let's just say it wasn't his his father the fact that his father was still even willing to share his testimony because sometimes something you know sometimes our addictions or whatever the case you know the things that we shrug, struggle with secretly are so close or is something that's so we're you know ashamed of 
we're, we're scared to share how we got through it. But when, you, when you're able to be that vulnerable with God first and then allowing him to bring you through it and bring you out of it, it allows you to let somebody else know that you can get through it because I'm, you might not have been able to see that I was going through this thing on the outside because sometimes we're good at dressing things up. But when you're willing to, you know, to bear your soul, really, if you will, or, or your testimony to someone else and let them know that I'm not the only one, you know, struggling with this or I wasn't the only one. I'm not the only one trying to go through this. And, you know, the Bible speaks of how that, um, you know, I'm totally paraphrasing, but um, how the Bible says that your brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are going through some of the same things that you're going through. You know what I'm saying? So I think that when we are willing to bear that, it helps our brothers and sisters and it just lets, lets us know that you can get through it because I got through it too. Right. You know what I mean? No, that I mean, that's a good point because a lot of times, you know, God delivers us and brings us through a situation and we, we keep it to ourselves, you know, but you don't know how sharing your story will minister to somebody else, right? And, and I always say, you know, the, the best witness is your story, right? Not how many scriptures you know and how many, you know, Bible stories you know front and back and how many characters and how many books of the Bible you memorized and, and, and all of that. That's good, but what's your story? You know, how has God delivered you? How has God blessed you? How has God helped you? And, and so when we can get to the point where we can share our story, you know, and, and granted, you got to you gotta use discernment and you got to be led by the spirit of God because not everybody can handle your story, right? Some people he hear your story and they want to go tell your story, right? Be, but so you got to be mindful of that. But at the same time, you know, you can't, if God blesses you, you got to share it, right? Because it's, it's you. Nobody can tell your story like you. Right, you might know a part of my story and this, you know, one aspect of it, but you don't know my whole story, right? And so it's up to me to share as God gives it to me, but we gotta be willing to to share our testimony because it can help other people. Mm -hmm. Amen. Any 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 last comments? We are actually a couple minutes over, but I, I wanted to to give you some opportunity because um to, to discuss this. The one thing that I got here from Anaya, Anaya said, um, you know, she based herself on the basketball, being the super Bowl, uh, super basketball player. Mm -hmm. um, she based herself on what we do. We base ourselves on what we do rather than who we serve. And if we base ourselves on who we serve and we show that, you know, our light will shine, God's light will shine, and everybody will see exactly. We don't need to base ourselves on what we do. And that's what I got from her story. And that's true. I mean, a lot of times we, we, we tend to base our identity on what we do, right? And then when what you do, you can no longer do, it causes confusion no. because now I can't do that thing which I identified with. Now you got to try to rediscover who you are, right? I, I've been laid off or, you know, I moved to a new city and I, you know, everything I know is gone. Now I got to readjust and figure out who I am in this new environment, in this new city, in this new job, in this new career. And, and so, but when our identity is in Christ, it don't matter where we are. It don't matter what profession we're in because I'm rooted in him. And I know that no matter what, he's got me. And so we got to make sure that we are identifying with Christ because wherever, you know, when we keep that Christ centeredness, it doesn't matter what I do. And, and I remember when 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 Kanye West was was having his you know revelation he I think it was Jimmy Kimmel or somebody that was interviewing and he was like oh so now Kanye you are you are you a Christian rapper now right and so he said no he said he said I'm not a Christian rapper he said I'm a Christian everything right it's it's, it's who I am like this I'm not I'm not uh you know I'm not just a preacher I, I'm I'm not just a teacher I'm I I am a child of the most high God. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so no matter what I do, no matter where I go, I represent the king of king and the Lord of Lord because I'm a king's kid. And, and so no matter what I do, if I'm on the job, I'm, I'm representing Christ. If I'm on the bus, I'm representing Christ. If I'm in my car, I'm representing Christ. If I'm with my family, I'm representing Christ. I am 
who God says I am, regardless of where I am. And so, um, any, any final thoughts? Yeah, this is uh, Marnie. Um, Anaya. Um, so it wasn't until she was able to identify herself with Christ and not with what she did. And it was, it was then when she was able to start to forgive the person that, you know, gave, gave her the concussion. But correct me if I'm wrong, but did I also hear that she was able to forgive herself? All right, yeah. yeah. So, and I was like, so that was interesting to me that it's not until we are able to truly identify ourselves through who, through Christ is at that time and, and moment that we can start the process to forgive ourselves for whatever that thing is, you know? No, and, and it, I mean, forgiveness it is, it is one of the hardest things to do. But when you get there, it is liberating. But I, I know for a fact that when we don't forgive others and ourselves, it keeps us stuck. It keeps us stuck in that place. And I, I'll share this a little bit, and then um, I am going, going to, to, to wrap it up. So I want to be mindful of your time. Um, but I know, like for myself, you know, when I used to live in Baltimore and I was in ministry, when the Lord opened my eyes and I left Baltimore, because of everything I experienced there, I had some unforgiveness within me, you know, towards ministry, towards my, my former pastor. And it set so deep within me that it caused me not to go to church for eight years. I still love the Lord. I still pray. I still read the Bible and study, but I wasn't interested in going to nobody's church. And it wasn't until I got to a point where I was ready to forgive my, my former pastor and forgive myself that I felt like, you know, if I was really called to ministry, then I wouldn't have been subject to that. I would have realized that this was wrong and this was wrong. And, you know, I, so I, I was beating myself up. I was like, how in the world did I get deceived like this? How do I get, you know, so caught up in this? You know, but as I was able to, to let go of that and, and to forgive him and for, to forgive myself, it was only at that point that the Lord allowed me and Pastor Kirkland to cross paths. Now, for eight years, I lived on 7th Street, rode past CBC every day on my way to work. But it wasn't until I was ready to forgive and say, OK, God, I'm ready to, to do this, this, this church and ministry thing again. But I was like wherever I go has got to be right. I ain't just going to say I went to church. Wherever I go has got to be right. And, you know, I, you know, I visited other places, but I never found that place. And so God sent Pastor Kirkland literally to my door. He knocked on my door. You know, we talked about campaign stuff, you know, it was election time. But after that, you know, he asked me, he said, where do you go to church? I said, I don't. You know, I, was, I haven't found a place to worship. And that's when he invited me to CBC. And, you know, I've shared the, the story of how everything unfolded, but it didn't happen until I was willing to forgive, until I was willing to let that go and open myself up to the opportunity to get back in ministry that the opportunity presented itself. And so a lot of times when we don't forgive, it's like a, unforgiveness is like a clogged pipe right you you the water is on but it ain't going down because it's clogged and when you let it go it's like drano that that joker just zoo, 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 and it, and it go on down the pipe it could have went down if you just put the drano of unforgive of forgiveness in and so it's it's hard to get to that point it's a process but when you get there and you let it go it it opens up the next opportunity for you um and so, you know, we got to keep, you know, realizing that our foundation should be on the word of God and that, that our identity should be in Christ and not in what we do, but in who we are and who we've been recreated to be, made in the image and likeness of God and realize that we, we, God has called us to be different and that we should not be ashamed to be different, 
but to walk different, to talk different, to lift up a standard of righteousness so that those in the world can see the difference in our lives and be drawn to that light away from the darkness. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, Amen. Um, that, uh, yeah, we're going to wrap it up on that one because I could keep going. But um, next week, I want you to watch uh, video number three. Video uh, number three is on uh, a different heart. So different foundation, different identity, and next week is in on a, a different heart. So that's video number three. Uh, watch that. If you haven't watched the other two, get caught up so you can, you know, know where we at. Um, but next week, uh, chapter number, uh, lesson number three on a different heart. Amen. Let's pray and then I'll unmute everybody uh, and give you a chance to say good night to folks. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word. God, we thank you for the opportunity just to identify with you, to realize that our identity should be in Christ and not in what we do, but our identity should be in who we serve. And so, God, we just thank you for saving us, for delivering us. God, help us to develop the courage and the compassion to share our testimony, to share our story. Thank you, God, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. No plague shall come nigh our dwelling. God, we thank you that we're blessed going out. We're blessed coming in. Thank you that your favor surrounds us like a garment. God, we pray that you would continue to keep our families covered, God, that you would Continue just to have your way in our lives. God, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in our lives. We thank you for our pastor, our first lady, God, and the ministry as we get ready to uh, return to the sanctuary. God, just give us the, the wisdom to do things decently and in order. We pray, God, that your will would be done in the sanctuary, that people would come back on fire and ready to praise the Lord and not just have church as usual, but commit to living a transformed life. And so, God, we thank you for the power to be different in every area of our life, to lift up a standard of righteousness. Thank you, God, that as we leave this broadcast, we never leave your presence. Thank you that your angels encamp round about us, protecting us on every side, and that we are blessed and highly favored until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.